Okay. Well, going live, I think in three, two, and one. So a very good evening to all of you over here tonight. Uh, welcome to Curious Course webinar, weekly webinar. And we are here tonight with uh, Jian Ko from TripAdvisor, and I'll be introducing her in a moment. But before that, let me share with you uh, some context on why we are doing this webinar. So this happened during COVID. At the peak of COVID, a lot of user experience design events were canceled. And as a result, we decided to do something for the community. Uh, and as I was, I was also building a UX career accelerator on my end uh, and very invested in on the education side of things. So I decided to actually help the community out a little bit by inviting first friends of mine uh, to speak on the webinar and then uh, acquaintances and so on and so forth. So some friends are more available than others. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, Jian wasn't available at that time when I asked her. So now she is more available to come share her knowledge, experience, and um, her deep expertise in research. Um, and we are going to have a deep dive into research practices in the global markets. We're going to talk specifically about user experience research. We're going to speak about her experience uh, changing careers from advertising as an advertising planner into research. And at the same time, we're going to talk about certain practices that uh, and basics that you need to have as a junior UX research person or even as a product manager doing, doing research. So I think this is truly one webinar for everyone. And if you do enjoy this webinar, please uh, feel free to share this webinar. It's also on our Facebook page. Uh, feel free to just kind of go to our Facebook page, Curious Core, and share the webinar on your feed if you feel this will be of value to some of your friends. Okay, and thank you all for joining. We have about over 30 participants on the Zoom chat right now. Uh, if you like access, please uh, feel free to also sign up uh, on our website so you can join future webinars. And right, let me start with an introduction uh, of Jian. And Jian is a UX researcher and strategist, and she sees her role as making sense of the unknown to provide perspective, clarity, and direction. I think that was a very interesting framework um, I was talking to Jian about, which we will share later as well, about how the job of a UX researcher is to provide insight and to provide wisdom and I think that's, that's also one area to explore this evening. And she is fond of uh, using qualitative and explorative, uh, exploratory research and has done few work across seven markets in APEC. And her role includes design thinking uh, as a trainer and as a facilitator, strategic planner previously in advertising and an ethnographer leading overseas pop-up studios. Uh, and we'll talk about pop-up studios and what, what they mean. And she has worked for DDB, Procter & Gamble, DBS, Standard Chartered Bank, and is now working at TripAdvisor. And she's interested in applying research for consumer tech, communities, and social impact. Um, and she is also working on some fun site projects uh, that we may, we may or may not talk about uh, after this, <laughs> uh, but we'll see. Okay, so... Once again, uh, tonight, uh, we're very lucky to have Jian um, share her experiences. So maybe Jian, let's start by um, with your current role at TripAdvisor, right? Uh, tell us a little bit about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. I have my TripAdvisor mug here, but this is the old logo <laughs> just for today. Um, I think on a day-to-day, -day, it's actually easier to say what I do on a week-to-week -week basis. Um, because I'm part of a product team um, and we have, so our cadence is kind of on a week basis. So every Thursday night, I have cat, um, catch ups with the greater product team. Um, and then Tuesday and Thursday mornings, I have catch ups with my core product team um, to see what's the updates on, you know, research, design, and um, any other sites. So I think the work is kind of structured around. Um, that um, in my day-to-day, -day, I can be doing things such as uh, 
planning planning the research um, like or setting it up. Um, I can be working closely with the designer um, to, for example, um, if it's an exploratory phase to um, brainstorm new features to test, whether through like concept testing or through a survey or prototype testing as well. Um, I could be analyzing the results, um, speaking to stakeholders, and then like reporting it and sharing it back. Um, I think what I also do is I think I'm quite collaborative in nature. That means in terms of like gathering data, um, I would ask, you know, the data people what they know or um, ask maybe um, some of the people who've worked on it on their previous research and their take on it. Um, and for the report as well, I would give a sense check with my designers to see like, does this make sense and to help you find the story? Um, because I think maybe what is interesting to me as a researcher might be the nuts and bolts, but they're more, they might be interested in something else or something could be more actionable for them. Um, yeah, I think I also do have a lot of like uh, one-on-one catch-ups over coffee um, with my PMs especially to find out like, you know, what the needs are, fellow researchers and my team. So yeah, that's my life as a researcher. It's really Thanks. much depending on the phase of the project. Yeah. Mm. So you spoke about uh, working at TripAdvisor and your design team being based in TripAdvisor. So for the Asia Pacific uh, design team for TripAdvisor, uh, how many markets do you cover and which are some of the markets that you cover? Oh, um, I think for that, because right now we've structured the portfolio such that um, me and my other two designers in Singapore are actually working on global product. So that means we're not only looking at um, the, you know, APAC markets or global markets, for example, we're looking at um, like the core product. Um, we do have our market prioritization um, that we have refined last year and this year. Um, which APAC has taken a lead to make on, but I don't think I should share like, you know, <laughs> which are the key markets or uh, how many markets it is. Um, what I'll say is that um, TripAdvisor is a very international company, um, but we are quite more like American centric. So I think what the APAC office can offer is, um, you know, bringing a different perspective um, based on the competitors that we see um, or have a different perspective on maybe even from a research point of view, like how some things might translate into different markets. Um, yeah. Well, that's a good point. And I think uh, for the benefit of some people here who are a little bit new to the UX design industry, you know, what is the difference uh, between a UX researcher and a UX designer? Like what, what do they do differently? Like why, why is there a specialized UX researcher? Yeah. Mm, okay. Um, I think when I was in advertising um, of a side note, um, a creative director said it best of what a strategic planner is. He said a strategic planner is a creative who cannot draw, or who cannot write. <laughs> and I think that sums it up. Like, you know, um, as a UX researcher, I do know the basics of UX practices, but at most I can draw on pen and paper, but I'm not really good at actually sketching it out. Um, but I, I, it is my job to know, for example, um, you know, what's information architecture, what's um, like, you know, wireframes and the nuts and bolts of that. Um, the value that I provide is making sure that what we create connects to what people want. Um, so in the usual design thinking, um, um, you know, speak, there's that three concentric circles of, is it desirable? Is it viable um, and is it feasible? Desirable, like do users want it? Viable, um, does it make money? Feasible, can engineering make it? Uh, so my job is to make sure that we put, is it desirable first to make sure that users want it in the first place, um, that they find it desirable, that they have utility in using it and that they are able to use it. Otherwise we're gonna create something that has no value. For example, the Segway, when it first came out, it was like, wow, you know, such a great innovation, but we're Segways now. It's only used for like certain events in Sentosa for fun because it's not a usable product versus an e-scooter. Um, so yeah, my job is to make sure that what we do is um, number one, like helps is based on what users actually want. And the exciting thing about that and how it relates to exploratory research is that because I see what users want and what they need, I might be able to find opportunities that are not currently here based on how users are hacking things together. Yep. So yeah, that's what I do. I, I understand users. Yeah. I know UX design, but I cannot draw. 
Mm. Thanks for sharing. Uh, we have our first question for tonight. So I'm just going to surface the question. Thanks, Michael, uh, for asking. Uh, have you had to work remotely uh, because of the pandemic? If yes, how has that changed your approach to research? Mm. Yeah, so we're talking about remote research here. Okay. Uh, I think thankfully my research team has a good setup of um, the tools that allow us to work remotely. Um, for example, we use usertesting.com a lot, which allows us to use both um, remote, um, remote unmoderated as well as remote moderated um, tests. And this can be either usability tests or they can be interviews. Um, and so we have like prepaid that and we have that arrangement. It has been a lot easier to still continue using it. I think um, the challenge from more of a COVID thing is a budget perspective. Um, because budgets have been slashed, that would mean that um, more expense heavy research, such as recruiting for face to face interviews, uh, recruiting for uh, quantitative um, surveys, those, um, you know, is essentially like nothing for maybe a long period of time, but we had to rely on more remote means um, through usertesting.com. So um, again, I'm really thankful we have usertesting.com. Can, you can find your equivalent tools. There's also user Zoom and other ones that allows you to do remote testing. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, have, you, have you actually been working remotely um, before COVID? Or has, has this been something that caught your team by surprise? Um, <laughs> uh, I think um, I remember the result, the announcement came to work from home. I think right after our team had a happy Friday session of karaoke. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> a high of having fun together, then like, okay, we're not seeing each other. Um, but so with my own direct team, we haven't had that chance to work remotely. Um, but since I work a lot with HQ, which means a lot of night calls um, or a lot of morning calls, I think um, TripAdvisor does have a good setup with Slack, with um, our video conferencing to work remotely as well. Mm. Um, yeah. That's great. Uh, we got a couple more people joining in. So welcome. Uh, we have Jian Ko here from TripAdvisor uh, as a UX researcher. And we're discussing, was just discussing about remote research um, earlier tonight. Uh, we've got lots, lots of topics to cover. And let's, let's talk about one, right? Uh, yes, we were speaking about uh, how it is a responsibility for a user researcher to bring in insights and, and wisdom. So can you maybe share a little bit about, you know, what, what constitutes an insight and and what, what, is, what is wisdom in, in this case? Mm. You know, it's funny that you said it's a responsibility of the UX researcher. I would kindly mm. disagree with that. Oh, I okay. That, <laughs> go, go for I would it. say that it's the role of the UX researcher mm -hmm. to help to craft insight and wisdom, but mm. everyone has the responsibility to care about who your product actually goes to who's buying your product, who uses your product mm. at the end of the day. So maybe it's just like role versus responsibility thing. Um, and I guess it goes to what we were talking about yesterday about like how, um, you know, data is data versus knowledge um, versus insight versus wisdom, right? I think the role of um, a researcher or a, strate a strategist um, is to actually help to piece together the puzzles to say, you know, like what is salient? What are the core themes? Or like, what is the overall like mental map? And then what's the way forward? And it's, I think it's quite a luxury <laughs> for me actually, for someone to be so curious to get paid to, you know, be capable and, and to like, you know, bring things together and make sense of things. Um, and, oh, are you sharing? Oh yes, if you could find the one that was about insight. Oh. Oh, you mean the one oh, with the uh, with the diagram? Okay, was it not this one? Oh, I, I prefer the other one, but I think this one works as well. Yeah, this is this okay. is good. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think you can see the bits about decision and risk. Mm -hmm. I think the the point of research is um and why we we synthesize things to a level of insight and wisdom is that um with information you still don't know what you you do. You can might have information paralysis. You have like bits of data floating everywhere, but you're like, so what? Um, but with 
Um, but when you're at the level of like knowledge where it's synthesized, you can make sense of things and you can start to see meaning or patterns about it. Um, I think an example is, um, for example, if you have in TripAdvisor, we have a segmentation um, about um, how, uh, yeah, we have a segmentation. And with that segmentation, we are then, I'm then able to look at certain behavior and say like, oh, that falls into this segment A, or this falls into this other segment. And then I can lay it on top of a behavioral segment of like how they use a certain product feature. And then it gives me a lot more um, area to understand it and to repeat the knowledge that I'm able to look at a certain pattern and immediately like sync it up into where that might fit in the mental map. So mm. I think that's the area of knowledge. Um, oh no, but maybe it's called wisdom because it's a patterns. But then mm. I think the bit about wisdom is like having the core thing to say like, okay, if this is your framework, if this is your maybe six segments, like, you know, um, based on what we know and what the opportunities are, like this segment or like, you know, this feature, this opportunity space is the one that we should go big or go big on and like win in. And that's hmm. the difference. Um, yeah. And actually all of this in terms of understanding context, meaning and insight, sometimes it does take more of a leap and that needs to be trained over time, um, which is something that I've learned from really good creative directors in advertising because, mm. you know, you see the titans at work, they're able to synthesize like the, um, the signal versus the noise really quickly. And, mm. um, and you can learn from like that and be amazed by, wow, how did you get to that? Um, mm -hmm. so, so quickly. Yeah, yeah. So let's, let's talk about that. Like you, you spent some time at DDB, uh, you were an advertising planner and, yeah, like what what did you learn from advertising that you're still using today as a UX designer? Oh, um, actually a lot. I think um, I do appreciate my time as a um, strategic planner. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, I went into strategic planner because uh, if I can give a side note, first I um, being like a business major, I went into PNG because that's what every like marketing person wants to do. So I did an internship there, but then I was disappointed that. The marketing function and the research function sat separately, but because I wanted to be at the intersection of both, I wanted to both understand users and create the actionable impact. Um, so which is why I went into strategic planning and advertising. And I knew that I wanted to do strategic planning specifically for that reason to bridge insights and strategy. I didn't want to do any other role in advertising. Um, yeah, so that's why I went into advertising. Uh, I think what I learned from that is firstly, the brief to create the brief um, so in advertising, um, there's two briefs. There's the, the project brief, which the account executives create, and then there's a strategic brief, which, um, which us like strategic planners create. Um, what it means is that what the account executives create is directly from the horse's mouth from what the stakeholders say they want. But my job is to find out, okay, this is what the stakeholders say that they want, but this is what they actually need. Um, and this is what they're actually implying. Um, because, um, and bringing that to in-house, sometimes stakeholders, they tell you a solution because they'll think it'll shortcut you to get to where they want to go. But then me as a researcher, or as someone in the UX space, I'm able to say, okay, um, you actually wanted something else. This is a better way to get you there. Um, I think one example, yeah, one example was that um, there was this project that um, the, the stakeholder said like, okay, just create these, like, you know, just create these three mockups, um, like high five. Um, but then I think what she actually wanted is to say that, okay, she saw these three as like a representative template. And then how can we create one, but also do a content audit in order to better understand how this one template can be used across the different ones. Is this the one with the hamster example? Oh no, that's another example. This okay. is because, oh yeah. I think an advertising client will tell you the most ridiculous things like, I got a great idea. You know what? We need, we need a hamster. And you're like, hmm. <laughs> so you learn not to take what clients say so seriously, but you help them get to what they want at the end of the day, which is their KPIs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I relate to, I relate to this ex experience from a certain level, working as an account servicing person uh, early, very, very early on in my career, where I actually took stakeholder, um, requirements in and crafted it into a brief for the creatives and as i as i look back and as i reflect back i realize um that process if it's complete if there is a strategic planner in the process 
uh, there is a process of analysis of the data over there. So I realized in smaller agencies, there's a lack of analysis in that process. So without that analysis, without that insight, uh, the creatives actually work with a very rough brief or a very bad brief and actually are not able to deliver on on the best ideas in the market. So this this is just me like reflecting uh, back on my advertising career. And I just realized, okay, how important um, research and analysis is in as part of uh, the creative process, uh, which is not done sometimes, right? Or many times um, in, in certain situations. So we, we do have a question that I think is quite related um, to what we're talking about over here, right? Uh, this is someone who has uh, previous academic research experience, uh, familiar with qual and quant methods and analysis, and have been practicing some specific UX research methods and analysis, uh, which is in a case study. So he or she would like to know, um, in your opinion, how does one know whether they are ready to apply for a UX research position? Like, how mm -hmm. do you tell? Yeah. Mm. It's the most recent question. Yeah. yeah. In terms of capable or ready, um, maybe if I can flip the question a bit, it's more of like how, what a, what does someone with an academic skill set need to learn in order to transition to UX research? So it's more applicable. Um, I think the key differences is um, number one, the timelines, number two, the output, number three, the stakeholders. Um, so in terms of the timelines, um, if uh, academic, re academic research is usually like really long timelines that in-house in we don't have the luxury to have, if only we did. Um, so I think what I would be looking for is like, you know, their flexibility to not be so, if I may call it purist on like, what is the, the like ideal scenario, but be able to be like flexible methodologies um, and to find proxies as needed. You know, it's not about cutting corners, it's about like, with this given time and budget, like what is a good enough proxy that would get them, get us the insights and decision we need. Uh, so that's a time, timelines thing. Timelines, what's the other thing is it? Okay, stakeholders um, and output. So in terms of the output, I think in academic research, um, a lot of like, we, we pride ourselves on thoroughness. And by we, sometimes me as a researcher, even like building my own craft, I know I wanna be thorough. I know that I have analyzed the results properly. But what stakeholders are looking for, they're like, okay, what's the so what? You know, what's the bottom line? And um, they need, they maybe need just that those like five slides. Um, I'm still in the process of working up to it because, um, as a researcher, you would know that we have to synthesize information from the ground up, from like the weeds to get to that level. But they're looking at that level. Um, so it's also about how, um, how much we're able to communicate at that level and know what the stakeholder is looking for in order to present it in a way that they're more receptive to it, um, rather than maybe a fixed method of like, you know, a hundred page report or a hundred deck slide. Um, yeah, I think that would be my answer. If, if you mm. show flexibility in, um, in that, then yeah, you will be ready. Yeah. Okay, hope we answered your question, uh, Sana. Okay, and... so it. <laughs> Yeah, so I uh, wanted to also ask you a question uh, with regards to something we spoke about previously. Um, and, you know, when we talk about the few work that you've done, so let's talk about the few work that you've done overseas, right? To, uh, as I understand, in your seven markets, you said you've done work in China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Korea, Singapore, Thailand, and Laos. And uh, you've, you've done visual ethnography, you've done cultural immersion and homestay with the Aborigines. Uh, so you've done actual field work um, on, on site. Uh, and you've also done a lot of other, uh, conducted a lot of methods as well. So I, I wanted to just get a sense, uh, you know, like maybe you can share some stories or some things to note when you're doing overseas field work or overseas research work? Yeah. Um, I think firstly, shout out to 
Dr. Carol when I was in university um, because when I was in university, I did, um, I, I did a double major in business and sociology. And he did a course on visual anthropology, which for summer school, which meant that we went overseas to do ethnographic filmmaking. Um, so that was really fun. And I think that got me really interested in it um, because it was just a sense of, you know, doing all the academic research and secondary research of papers but then going into field and being like completely surprised, but in a good way with like what emerges. And I think that's just a very interesting and eye-opening experience. Um, mm. Okay, back to your question. What was it, some of the learning? Not, uh, yeah, like tell us a story or what, what did you do? Uh, what, what should we take note of if we were to go overseas and do research? Mm. I think um, one key thing is actually to be aware of our positionality um, and our access. Um, this is especially for more ethnographic research. Um, because uh, maybe one short story, um, this is when I was in university, we were going to do documentary filmmaking in Southern Thailand. Um, so we were supposed to go with my team on a certain day, but I just went a couple of days earlier um, as a solo trip to check out another town called Songkla. And when I was there by myself, um, it's a small fishing town. Um, what happened was, yeah, what happened was that I was walking at night. I think someone's um, trading <laughs> audio is on. Anyways, um, okay, yeah. So I was I was walking alone at night in this um, Thai fishing town, and this older lady came up to me and she said, um, "Hey, what are you what are you doing here?" And I'm like, "Oh, I'm just exploring." She's like, "Are you alone?" I'm like, "Yeah." She's like. You're, you're a woman and you're alone. This this place is not safe. You should you should not be here. And then later she asked, oh, what are you doing tomorrow? Do you have any plans? If not, why don't you come by and I'll take you to the temple right behind my house because I'm going there. And this whole conversation happened in Thai because at that time I could speak Thai. Um, so that, and a similar thing happened like a few hours later that night, this older woman came to me. She said, what are you doing? This place is not safe. You should not be at out here at night, what are you doing tomorrow night? Let me take you out for dinner. Um, so that got me thinking that, you know, if I was not a woman, if I was not out there at night, um, if I did not speak Thai, I would not have access to these um, different experiences and information that these people are more willing to share. Um, so I think that's my first point that um, as an ethnographer, we have to be aware of like where we're coming from and what that would mean in terms of the data we collect. Like I might have access to data, um, but maybe I'm not the best person to do certain types of data, for example, um, in another case. Um, I remember when I was in advertising, my friend said that um, like someone was running a focus group on condoms and then it was, uh, <laughs> they had like 13 people in the focus group, all men, and the facilitator was a man. And he told me about some of the findings that they found. And I was thinking like, okay, if I ran that focus group, I would not be able to get that level of truthfulness because I'm a woman asking men and they might be, you know, it'll, it'll be a different sort of, sort of power dynamics. Um, so yeah, I think that's one thing to yeah. know. Yeah. And I think, I think you also mentioned uh, during our uh, conversation that uh, it, it's also necessary to use perhaps local translators and, oh, yeah. um, because they, that, that might actually help. Can you explain a little bit more uh, about that and, and what, what exactly is, uh, you know, setting up a studio, a uh, pop-up mm -hmm. studio? Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe for, for local translators, um, I, I would see it as maybe like three different setups, right? Um, for, for the interpreters. Um, firstly, we'll, we'll want to work with like sim simultaneous interpreters, which are people who can interpret on the spot. Um, so imagine that like, let's say it's you and me, Dalen, and we're sitting like next to each other. And then a simultaneous interpreter is sitting in between us and she's translating. Um, as you're saying something, she's translating back. Um, so that's the case for simultaneous interpreters. So there's different levels um, depending on maybe your comfort with the language or like the setup. Um, like one extreme is to have humility to say, maybe I'm not the person, best person to do this research. I'm gonna outsource this to someone else. Um, and then the other, the other extreme is that I have, I do the whole research plan and the interview, but then there's a simultaneous interpreter who's interpreting for us. Um, I, in another setup, 
um, in one setup I had, we had that situation where it's, um, you know, the participant, um, simultaneous interpreters and researchers. Um, in another situation, my, um, my colleague could speak Chinese because she was from China. So um, she was the one who was the lead interviewer throughout, but um, I was the one who was the lead, um, I guess like lead of the project because I crafted the research plan, the research aims and everything, but she was the one conducting most of the research. Um, yeah, I think some things to take note of if you're gonna be working with a translator and this is what I've learned from experience. Um, number one, the best case scenario is to have the same translator throughout so that they're, they're familiar um, and they use the same language. Um, when I was in Korea, um, we, we were swapping translators. We had at least four translators swapping in and out. Um, and I, because some of the terms were not translated to the same phrase, it was only later that we realized that they were talking up about the same thing, but then they, use, they might have used a different phrase for it. So that was one thing. Um, I think the second thing is when um, know where the translator is coming from and brief them how you plan to conduct the research, not only in terms of the topic, but how you ask a question. So I remember there's this one time um, I was doing the research also in Korea with the translator. And um, um, I had noted that I wanted in my own notes that I wanted to go deeper into this topic because the, the participant only talked about it like, you know, halfway and I wanted to go deeper. So I asked it um, again, and I thought I asked it in a different angle. So it was like discreet enough but the um, translator turned back to me and she said, oh, the person already answered it and then gave the answer. <laughs> so um, later I had to like, you know, ask and rephrase again. But after the interview, I said, oh, my intent there was actually to go deeper because blah, 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 blah. Um, so oh, I thought- So like sharing with them the method then. Yeah, because mm. maybe the interpreters are just saying like, um, asking like, why are you asking it again? Like we already have this information. Mm, yeah. yeah. That's, oh, well, thanks for sharing. I think that's also like the, the meat of what we wanted to cover for this specific topic uh, where we're doing research globally. So would you mind explaining, um, you know, what, what is a pop-up studio and, and uh, what, what does it mean in this UX design process? Hmm. Um, I think my learnings from pop-up studios, um, a lot from Yan Chip Chase, so you can check out his workshops and his books about that. Um, yeah. Uh, I think a pop-up studio is, it's kind of a setting, it's kind of, it's, it's going to a, a different market and having the ability to immerse in that space and to have a space for not only research, but synthesis um, and as well as a space for like the local guides and fixes to help come in and to improve their thinking in that space. Um, so when we were doing it for, um, um, in my previous company, what happened is that I think number one, the, the presence of local guides are very important to get you up to seat and to also be the fixer to help set everything up so that when you go there, you can conduct your research more smoothly. Um, I think the second thing is having that physical space where like your whole team is together, where you can live and breathe the research. So what this means is that like we had a war room with like all of the findings on the walls and the typical like post-its on the walls kind of fashion. But there is a um, there is benefit to it because you are seeing all this data um, like visually, and you get a chance to like um, you know scan it and put things together um, very mm. easily, um, yeah. and just the ability to um, to even bring stakeholders into the space to say um, this is what we found, um, like this is salient, and to synthesize it on a spot. It's I think quite a quite a fun thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's also like the additional benefit of. Um, this this the spatial immersion on its own, right? Just not just the data being in the spatial environment where you playing with your hands and the walls, but also the fact that they are they're absorbing information, right? Just being yeah. in a space itself, uh, I think that's that's really interesting. Um, we might have been to the same workshop. Uh, not that I recall, I met on oh. one of your colleagues that. Yeah, it's it's that short workshop by by Jan, right? And he gives you yeah. like this really thick book. Okay, yeah, I I think I remember that workshop. Paid, paid for it. <laughs> so yeah. um, I think when it comes to overseas research, I I do recall one one thing, which was the importance of speaking the local language um, of mm -hmm. of the people there, right? Like um, as I as I recall, like when I was conducting research in Hong Kong. 
Um, and when I ask someone a question in English, um, they answer in a certain way. If I ask the same question in, in Cantonese, uh, they answer in a completely different way and bring in like slangs and, and stuff like that. So yeah. that's, yeah, that's, that's just so much nuance to like something as simple as doing like overseas research. And I think uh, that, that's definitely something. Do you have uh, books to recommend or anything like that? Um, so people can... Like we're just trying to answer the topic over here, right? Like if one wants to do research and few work overseas, is there a book you would you would recommend people to read? Um, I think I would recommend Yan Chip Chase's book. Um, okay. On that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll or, try and find I think the link. Maybe what I'll recommend instead is to, like, if you're planning to conduct it, um, first like learn through experience if you have for example a consultant who has done it before and they can show you the first time then you can get more comfortable to do it subsequent times and that will be a better immersion uh that's what mm. happened with me because we had a consultant come in um, with us to do it for the first time in hong kong so we then can that replicate it and improve on that in the, the markets yeah the, uh, did you mean the few study handbook the one that he gave us Yes, he didn't okay. give it to us, he bought it. It's, it's right in front of me as well. It's like okay, this. got it. Yeah. Understood. Um, that's, that's awesome. Uh, Omar was asking something related. I think this is just great add-on. Uh, Omar asked, what is good synthesis? Yeah, that's a good question, but I think it takes time to train over practice. Um, one thing is um, that I would say is um, this, this, this graph, about like, you know, research saturation. So imagine like, you know, your learning goes like this and it plateaus. So I think first you have to get to that point um, in your studies that um, you know that um, for in my maybe like 10 participants or whatever, I have reached research saturation on this topic. So then it's okay to start to synthesize. If you know that you haven't reached that stage then maybe you should be doing more research um, to plug it before you start to synthesize. Um, yeah, so that's the first thing. Second thing in terms of what makes good synthesis, um, I, th <laughs> I think it's, um, it's when it's very clear and it reaches, when it's very clear and it reaches almost the aha state. It's almost as if, hmm, it's almost as if like that model or that line was waiting for you all along. And then when yeah. you get, you kind of get like a sigh of relief, like, oh, okay, I don't, I don't need to worry at like 2 a.m. to get there <laughs> anymore. Um, Do you mean like a hidden in plain sight moment? Um, kind of. It's like, mm. you know, it's like something is still eating at you. Mm. And, and, but when you get it, you, you can like breathe a sigh of relief. Nice. Yeah. Um, okay. I think that's the internal feeling. But externally, what that w might look like is that maybe a good synthesis is a really strong insight that has a um, that has a tension in it that can drive direction. Um, so, for example, um, I think where a lot of okay, an example is maybe non non synthesized work would just be like summaries and bullet points. But then, like number one, they don't point to a direction and they're they're not connected. And number two, they they're just data points that are just literally like floating in space. You don't know where to place them. But with the synthesis, you have like a mental model or a framework to know where this is so that there's a pattern that you can then make sense of it. And you can then use this pattern in different situations because it's to a point where it's replicable and it's like knowledge driving. Um, I think um, in one of the projects I'm doing now, um, I looked at, uh, it was kind of a uh, mixed method um, I did a mixed method um, um, study where I used like, you know, competitor analysis. I did digital ethnography, um, like surveys, um, um, stakeholder interviews. And then I summarized like these are the key behavior groups on this certain product feature. And then when it got to that point, um, then like people like really caught on to these um, behavioral segments and they were using some of these terms in like, you know, months later, they're saying like, oh yes, I. Um, I think I am this behavioral segment as well. Um, so yeah, that's when you reach a good point. Yeah. Great. I hope we answered your question, Oma. Um, I think 
now I'll, I'll start answering, uh, asking some of the questions that have been typing in the chat. Um, because most, I'll, I'll say there are two broad categories. Uh, one would be working, right? Related to working as a UX researcher. And the other would be actually related to like career stuff. So I'm just going to cover this one. Um, and Dick was asking on, you know, how do you ensure that every corner is covered in a short amount of time uh, as a designer or as a researcher, right? Is, is there like a, a checklist that you use uh, to ensure, because especially when you're working so fast, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, is there like always like some of the things that you always do and check off um, when, when you're working super fast? Um, I think as a product designer, what I will assume is that your project, you already have a project brief. So everyone is on the same page of what's your project um, aims, metrics, uh, challenges, constraints, resources. So that allows you to work more iteratively as, um, as speed. So what then I'll need to do is work on the research brief. So for my research brief, I will have like, what are the research aims? What are the initial findings that support it? What are the open questions? What are any hypotheses going in? And then I'll have the discussion, um, the discussion guide that has the key areas that I want to look at. So maybe this is not so much about having all the corners covered, but is to be more intentional and focused to know like, what am I actually trying to get? And then how, how can I test it? I think um, one example is um, to know the distinction between, for example, testing um, desirability versus testing usability. You can have like one prototype for an app, but to test, um, but as a researcher, um, I'll have a good gauge to say like, okay, you know what? We don't even know if people want this feature in the first place. Therefore, I'm gonna suggest testing desirability and understanding rather than go into usability testing, which will only come later if people like this in the first place. So it's not so much about any corner, every corner, but it's like, what does this need at this time? Yeah. Mm. So it sounds like uh, we have to start with the right questions and the kind of questions we want to answer, or even with the assumptions uh, that we have. And then that uh, effectively helps to answer so-called the most important parts of the brief. Um, am I sort of like rephrasing or paraphrasing what you just said correctly? Um, I think it's, yeah, as in generally is having the right answers, but as a researcher, I have my research plan and the research mm. plan will be focused with the research aim areas, um, aim areas and questions in order mm. to be more targeted rather than have you have every corner. Yeah. Okay. So, Got it. Um, but I think in the thing that you said, is there any list that you check off inside you hit it outside referring to Dick? I think mm. the I would also have my own internal framework of like, what is the most risky thing in this product right now that we need to test? Like, is the most risky thing usability? Is the most risky thing like understanding or desirability? And then that's the one that I would test because it's going to make or break the actual product. Yeah. Mm. That's a sound strategy. And uh, we have another question about working and Majin wanted to ask, uh, you know, when it comes to research outcome, right, versus the design outcome, uh, mm -hmm. have you been in a situation where they are actually different? Yeah. And meaning the vision of success for the UX researcher and the UX designer uh, who work on uh, the output is different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would say that that has been the case. And it also depends on the setup. I would mm. say that um, it depends if it's a project or a product setup. In a project team, what happens is like the researcher will come in during the project as in doing the research phase in a, more, in a more waterfall setup. And then I might come up with recommendations because it's a project, then I would have to like jump off the project to go into another project, um, you know, to come up with research recommendations. So in that case, like where the recommendations come might be out of my hand and I'm not fully involved in project. Um, the difference in a product setting is that we are the same product team, you know, research, design, data, PM, engineering throughout. So we should be aligned the whole way and working, um, working together. So in, that's why 
<laughs> that's why I much prefer working in product teams, to be honest, because the um, the opportunity for success at the end of the day is a lot greater because um, you're working consultatively and collaboratively, collaboratively with the designer at the end of the day. You have a better working relationship with your designers. Um, you're on the same page to support their work and they in turn support your work. Um, so yeah. It yeah, that's probably more shared, uh, shared vision. So I hope we also answered your, your question, Praveen and Nijin. Um, and it also sounds like it's, it's a agreeing at, at very least what what is the vision for success right on on both ends uh i would like to ask in terms of career now i think uh there, there are some questions with regards to career uh how how do you ux designers work with the findings ux researchers bring in what are the things you guys use to communicate I, I guess what are the artifacts that uh ux researchers produce and how how should ux designers use it that sounds like the question <laughs> how should ux designers use it um i think um okay there's the best practices or there's a standard way and this the second one is like how i prefer to do it <laughs> okay i think in the standard way the artifact is usually in a deck or in a written report with like, you know, the executive summary, the key findings um, and the recommendations and how the designer would use it is they'll take the recommendations um, or, and then like, you know, work on it. Depending on different stages of the, um, depending on different stages of the design, I think that there's better ways to present the data. For example, if it's usability testing, um, I, I would prefer to present it in a in an Excel sheet that I show like this is like the list of things this is like recommended um, this is the severity of like pain point or this is like the volume of how of how many people felt felt this is, it was a pain point or even if you're measuring task success then this is tax success so then the designers will have and the PMs will have a neat list of like these are all the things that I should fix in terms of findings recommendations and they can do it um, if it's um, I think if it's more at a, something at a more exploratory or foundational stage, um, then something that might be more helpful is actually, um, okay, let me rephrase that. I think nothing beats just having discussions with your designers um, and just talking through the research and then gelling and coming up with better ideas and better solutions for it. Um, this is why I really love my <laughs> my designers shout out to the um, Brandon and Alec for being such good peers because whatever I come up with um, and like like firstly I think they trust that the intent of it is to serve the design it's, it's not it's not research versus design we're all on the same page that we want it to be desirable at work um, secondly we're able to like take the artifact and build on the recommendation so maybe for example I would give a recommendation to say like oh for this, this segment um for example, for example, maybe for this segment, we need a tool for organization of da 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 da. And then I might give one example, for example, this, but then they can build on it to say, oh, maybe these are better ways to organize it, or these are better things. So then they can take it up a notch. And this is like what I really enjoy, this collaborative process that maybe I'll point them to, this is the opportunity space, but they will be in a better place to come up with feature solutions um, in order to solve for it yeah hmm. and i guess uh, when when it comes to insight and when it comes to artifact um how do you know if your artifact is is working you know like how do you tell as a as a user researcher like you've done you've done your work properly yeah mm -hmm. i think um when i'm able to <laughs> when i'm able to share on slack like hey, I have the report, please look at slide three for this executive summary and slide four for the one pager mental model that summarizes it. <laughs> That's when I know I've synthesized it to a level that this one pager can hold like, you know, most of the understandings. So I see the executive summary as like maybe more of like a text or bullet point way to say the overview. 
but I would have a mental model of maybe these are the segments or these are the needs and pain points that can summarize the whole thing and then they can deep dive into it. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Uh, let's let's do a, a, a fun question. Uh, so that it's not so intense. Uh, so Yingling from Carol Zell, uh, UX researcher at Carol Zell has a personal question for you. She say you're a volunteer coach at Forest School Singapore. Oh. Uh, from your experience, how do you think user research can be done with children? Ooh, done with children. <laughs> um, um, firstly, there's a lot of ethics regarding that. So you have to make sure that you assign your NDAs, right? Or you get legal to approve. Um, because for most, a, a lot of research, we don't conduct it with people under 18 because they'll need like parental consent and everything. So yeah, that's one thing. Um, I think secondly, um, the great thing about children is like, number one, they're brutally honest if they like or they don't like it. Um, and secondly, they're more imaginative than any of us can ever be. Okay, maybe not ever, but then, then most of us adults with our logical brain can be. So there's ways that we can make use of that. They will be really great in co-design sessions. For example, um, instead of instead of asking them how they feel about something and making it a like conversational based um, thing, um, what I would recommend is number one, observe their usage of their current solution of like you know the current state. Observe their usage of the your prototype and how they interact with it, and um, number two, do co-creation sessions with them. By co-creation, I'll, I'll, for example, ask like, okay, if you had a magic wand and you can create anything to allow, um, I don't know, um, to allow you all to play together without getting tired, I don't know, um, or like, or something like that, what would you create? Um, and then I give them like coloring tools, I give them Lego, Lego blocks, or just allow them to express it in, in any means they want. Um, I think this will be a far better solution. Another thing to know about kids is that their own preferences is also very shaped by their social group. So how I interact with this will be very different when how we interact with it in a, in a social scenario with my friends versus with my parents. So I also observe those um, different scenarios when they're interacting as well. Now you make me want to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's an interesting one we um for our ux career accelerator we actually had the opportunity to do research with kids um for for this client called aya and um yeah they just deal with like um a very uh they deal with kids a lot so and, and teenagers so i think some of the points you mentioned was also something that the team found out uh, as they were doing their research for the very first time um, I'd like to ask you like some final questions about uh, career, right? And I think um, if I, uh, if someone wants to prepare a portfolio as a UX researcher, you know, how should they go about doing it? Or is there any example they should look at uh, when doing so? Mm, okay. Um, assuming that you're not a UX researcher now and you don't have any existing case studies, what I recommend is to use the world around you for opportunities. Um, so for example, when I first um, started getting into UX research, I, I started by volunteering with a friend who was doing a, um, like a facilitation job to first find out what it is, um, like what does it look like? Um, I think the two areas that I, I recommend that you can volunteer to help is number one, um, if there's any like social good companies that you're working with a social impact space, help them out because these people are so focused on their domain that they might not have the best branding or color palette or font or, or like, um, you know, UX design. So, so um, like for example, Forest School, which I mentioned, <laughs> when I told them that I'm a UX researcher at the lunch table, then they started like um, saying like, oh my gosh, the website is a mess. Like, why are there two menus? Like, I cannot find anything. Um, so yeah, um, then I, I told them, like, you know, I'm happy to offer my services to help you if, in, in any way. So that's one avenue. The second avenue is your friends. So many people are doing their own side projects, your own home bakery, uh, your own thing. Um, I think how I have honed my skills is because I have friends doing that. And then I'll, I'll just say like, hey, do you want me to give feedback to your site? Um, I just did this a couple of weeks ago and I, I told her, then I just like listed it like, hey, I love the concept, but number one, you're 
your call to action is not very clear. I'm a bit confused because you're using different terms. Like number two, your Instagram tiles and your product tiles look too similar. People are going to get confused and gonna click into the wrong place. Number three, and just list it out and use, maybe you can even use that to, um, to uh, what do you call it, to build on your portfolio. Um, and do you have, say, a specific reference uh, in terms of a UX researcher's portfolio uh, that you might take reference to? Or do you have your own, I don't know, like publicly available? <laughs> well, I think my, mine's quite private. Um, I, okay. don't have a, I don't have a good reference. Okay, top that's of my fine. Head. Yeah. Um, uh, but I would say that the main mm. thing is to actually show the case study in terms mm. of, um, for example, like this is a... Um, the project background, methodology, findings, um, findings slash insight and impact, and then to show, for example, screenshots or photos of like some of these key ones. Um, hmm. Because these, the point of these portfolios is to show your thinking, um, show your the types of experience in your work, um, and what I'll be judging is actually to see their their thinking and the critical thinking through it. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. And. Uh, I guess a more general question would be, you know, what is the future of uh, user researchers? Um, and Chuning was mentioning in some teams, uh, the ratio for UX designer versus UX researcher is like one is to 10 or one is to five, or sometimes there's no specialized role in it. Yeah. You know, how do you, how do you see this uh, role uh, like uh, evolving in, in, the, in the future? Mm. Um, I, I see it as two ways, like number one, uh, specialization within the team and number two, um, growth of methodologies as a UX researcher. So firstly, in specialization in a team, um, I think Singapore is still quite um, like not as mature in UX design and research. So that's why we have like designers, research, and then like even these other specialties like content strategists. Um, and UX writers are not as many, but I think as um, as our company, as a, sorry, as the industry matures, we're gonna see more specialization and people are gonna move from being more generalist to specialist as well. Uh, secondly, in terms of the future of user research, um, how I see it, um, I don't know how much of this is grounded versus how I hope it is, <laughs> but I think um, like number one, we need, there's more talk about um, design for ethics um, and which is really good, but the question is, who is the one in charge of it? Whose responsibility is that? Um, like in some cases where the, we don't have money to hire Tristan Harris to have a <laughs> design philosopher, a tech humanist, I think the user researcher can take up the role and to synthesize or present things um, with the perspective of how this might look like in terms of long-term, what might be the ethical implications. To do that also would mean take up more different skill sets that we don't traditionally do right now, um, specifically um, systems thinking um, and maybe more like futures or long terms and organizational design. Uh, this is because I know the limitations in terms of user research is that we look at groups of people as if they're the same, but when people are interacting with each other or when it's a long, a different timeline, it's gonna be very different. Like more is not um, the same. So this is something that I'm also doing in my own career. I'm picking up systems thinking, not only to future-proof myself, but because I think this is the way it can probably, hopefully will go, um, that we'll start looking in terms of more like societal impact and long-term considerations of the work that we do. Mm. Lovely. And let's uh, end on a more fun note. Uh, <laughs> I guess, would you, would you like to share what are some of the, uh, what's, what's one interesting, project that you're working on on the site uh and is it open for the that's open for the public to also participate yeah uh okay um i think one thing on the side um, or semi-public this is like this is like a curated group <laughs> um yeah. maybe semi-public uh so so because we cannot travel um and how travel is actually seeing new experiences I'm like, what are the new experiences I can have in Singapore? And then I thought, this actually, Singapore has a lot of weird food that I'm not eating yet. <laughs> we have turtles, we have crocodile meat, we have um, sheep's brain, 
uh, all sorts of like fallopian tubes and like uh, penises and testicles. So I thought, <laughs> you know what? Let me let me let me create an experience to eat that. Um, so actually, this maybe was a design process because I first started out very lean. I created a Google Maps and put in all of like you know the turtle soup places, and I sent it out to my bunch of friends. And I asked like, hey, would you be interested to go and eat it? And they're like, um. Maybe not that, but maybe I can do the shark one or like, oh, maybe I'll eat weird fruits instead. So I had to pivot <laughs> because this was a, uh, an extreme audience. Um, so we do, so I am now doing these food adventures and we have different categories. One is like eating the weird foods. One is cuisine appreciation. Uh, for example, we have local guides um, like, you know, in Malay cuisine, in Asian cuisine, Thai cuisine, who would um, like, you know, bring us to eat something and show us a different site. And then the third aspect is new food experiences. So for example, we're doing one about like kayak foraging, fish, foraging, fe fishing and feasting. And another one on like farm tours, like farm to table stuff. So I guess um, maybe, um, and this is meant to be a mixed group thing to get like people to, some of my friends to interact with each other. And I find that they self-select based on what they're comfortable to eat. Um, so maybe if you're interested to join this mixed bag of people and to meet new people and try new foods, you can reach out to me. Also, if you have any specialization, like if you can forage, if you can feast, if you can fish, um, or like, you know, any of these interesting skill sets, or you come from a different cuisine, then yeah, maybe you can reach out and yeah, yeah. you can eat. <laughs> well, yes, I think I think it's important to have a, a side project uh, that you're passionate about. So uh, if anyone's a foodie, yeah, uh, you can, you can uh, <laughs> you can share. I mean, Korean says I boil rice and veggies in water and salt, and that's what I eat every day. Edge case, okay. Aureli says I'm a foodie. Okay, it looks it looks like there's a few. Looks like there's a few. Uh, if you're in Singapore, this will be open to you. Uh, you can reach out to Jian, and uh, I know some of you are from India. Like we still got over fifty people here on Zoom chat, so it looks like people are quite enthralled about what you're talking about. So uh, if you're from India or other countries, uh, unfortunately, you have to create your own food tour uh, if you're into weird food. So I think that's it for now. I, I can't, we, we couldn't ask all the questions we need tonight, but we are going to stop the live stream and um, we're going to spend maybe like extra 15 minutes for people to ask some questions if you want to stay. Ooh, but right. Oh, wow. Ants nest with egg white. Oh my God. Omar, Omar, Omar's from Penang. Wow, it's the one of the food capitals of the world. All right, okay, this is awesome. So I love love you all from all over the world joining uh, this webinar. Uh, some of you from Europe, I noticed as well. And thank you for participating. We will do our last webinar for the year uh, next week with Wuhan from Mind Valley. If you heard if you heard of Mind Valley, if you got uh, targeted by Mind Valley ads. Um, you're probably wondering how do they do their design and, and what's going on. So I, I got their chief product officer to uh, come speak and their chief product officer happens to be a designer. So we'll, we'll end the year with a bang. And uh, at the same time, uh, I think John's open to connecting on LinkedIn. So if you need to, uh, feel free to reach out to her, especially if you're into weird foods. Uh, that, that is a fantastic opener, by the way. <laughs> then I think she'll be very happy to connect with you. And at, at the same time, oh gosh, like Praveen saying, no, I'm turning vegetarian. This is too tempting. <laughs> okay, we, we had fun. I, I hope this has been an enjoyable conversation. And um, for those of you on Facebook, thank you for tuning in live on Facebook. Um, see you for one last time uh, next week. And then we'll be taking a, a short break and deciding on what's the frequency we will uh, be coming back with. But I think next year we'll have we'll continue to do this. I think this is this has been really fun. It's just that we might have to reduce the frequency a little bit. But uh, for next week, I will see you for our last uh, webinar for the year. Okay, and thank you so much for attending. Feel free to leave a thank you message uh, or reach out to Jan and leave a thank you message. So thanks for the hand claps and all that. All right, awesome. Wow, so, so many people from all over the world. Tia Thank says, I have some polished food. All right. Thanks for learning and for sharing your weird food. I will try. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Okay, so we're going to do...
to a, a, a short session. Uh, all right, thanks, Aureli. Okay, we're gonna do. We're gonna answer some some very quick questions. If you want to stay, we'll answer some of the career questions. Uh, I didn't really want to ask it because they are quite uh, specific. Uh, so Omar asks, is there a difference between user testing and usability testing, and does this fall under user researcher or UX designer? User testing and usability testing. I'm assuming that user testing means QA. Is that QA and bug hunting that, that you mean by user testing? Um, yeah. I think traditional tech companies, the testing function is actually more of QA. Um, yeah. User acceptance out, tests. Yep. Yeah, acceptance tests um, mm. to find out bugs. That is, I think, the lowest level of does, does <laughs> for your feature launch and not completely crash and die. <laughs> okay. Um, but that's different from usability testing, which is like, well, that can people actually use it? Um, mm. So it is different and it is usually done by different people and different teams as well. Um, mm. yeah. Sounds good. This is awesome. And uh, let's see. Well, 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 it looks like people are still refusing to leave. <laughs> yeah, there's no free food, guys. You can go home. Okay. <laughs> uh, are we still on Facebook Live? Oh, 